In the forests of Central Africa and the Congo Basin, researchers are using the power of AI to listen to the rumbles of elephants and the blasts of the poaching gunshots that threaten their lives, providing essential data to protect and conserve the remaining 10% of the region's elephant population. 10,000 miles away, in North Aotearoa, New Zealand, researchers are using underwater microphones to listen in on the pulses, groans, and moans of blue whales. Tracking and monitoring their reproductive and foraging patterns to better understand the impact of marine heat waves on their collective behavior. These are just two examples of the many ways researchers around the world are using the power of AI to protect and conserve our essential biodiversity. As a computer scientist working with machine learning and bioacoustics, I could talk for hours about the huge potential for AI to catalyze a new era of biodiversity conservation. Bioacoustics is essentially Shazam for nature. <laughs> Recordings on land and in water are collected by tiny little acoustic sensors like these ones. And powerful machine learning algorithms analyze those recordings, uncovering information on the wildlife within them. Now, as with many new technologies, the radical advancements often come with unintended risks. Whilst it's easy to get carried away with the hype of new technologies, if only listening to wildlife with AI could solve the biodiversity crisis, it would save conservationists a lot of time and effort and make this talk incredibly short. But there is an elephant in the room that conservationists and conservation technologists often neglect. People. Whilst we have come to know through a long line of harmful and discriminatory mistakes, the risks to society posed by AI and technology, whether that's deciding who goes to prison, who is stopped and searched by police, or who is hired based on race or gender. When it comes to conservation, many people find it a little harder to identify the potential risks posed by AI and technology. So I want you to all imagine that you're at home with your loved ones, the people that you cherish the most. Your partner, your parents, your children, or your friends. Imagine all of the intimate conversations that you'll have, all of the intense arguments, the roof-raising laughs, and all of the extended trips to the bathroom you're going to take. Now, imagine all of that recorded and mined by AI algorithms for research, but without you even knowing. Whilst this seems like quite an absurd example, it's a real concern for those who call home the forests used for bioacoustic research. It seems fairly obvious that violating people's rights to privacy in the name of biodiversity conservation is unacceptable. So why does it happen? In order to answer this question, we need to dive into the colonial roots of conservation. Behind the wildlife mascots and the wild expeditions, the high production, binge-worthy nature documentaries, biodiversity conservation has a dark and colonial history in which indigenous and local communities were treated not as humans, but as flora and fauna, collections of plants and animals. And these colonial ideas became embedded in what we call fortress conservation which is as friendly as it sounds. Fortress conservation is based on outdated and colonial theories, such as terra nullius, which saw Europeans declaring land as uninhabited based on prejudices against the local and indigenous communities that lived there. But forests aren't just environments to be sensed, measured and protected. Forests hold deep, generations old culture and wisdom, powerful healing and essential connection. 
In contrast to here in the global north where we live separate from our dwindling forests, for many in the tropics, forests are homes. So why am I, a computer scientist, talking about colonialism? And why am I not instead preaching to you about the power of AI to save the world? Trust me, I do get this question a lot, and not often in the most agreeable of ways. You see, whilst we like to think that colonialism lies firmly in the past, indigenous and local communities continue to be excluded from conservation research. Think about it. When was the last time that you saw a nature documentary feature any local people? How often are indigenous or local communities hailed as conservation heroes? Or praised for the many ways in which they protect vast swathes of our essential biodiversity? More often than not, when people from the global south are foregrounded, they are usually painted as forces for destruction only. And as we add more and more technology into the mix that is able to embed these biases, we feed it with these this discriminatory and colonial ways of thinking about the people who live closest to the environments we're trying to protect. That's why I work with communities to design and develop conservation technologies that work for both people and planet. I work towards conservation data justice, as was introduced earlier. This is a concept and field of research that was introduced by Rose Pritchard from the University of Manchester. And essentially, me and other researchers work towards this conservation data justice to make sure that technology does not exasperate the oppression already experienced by marginalised communities in the name of biodiversity conservation and hope that technology can actually work in service of the communities that live in areas of high biodiversity. Here's me with uh, the incredible team of community conservationists from the Ashanti region and ecologists from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, who I've been working with for the last two years. Instead of rolling out an entirely pre-planned research project or making important decisions from the confines of my academic institution, Nearly every step of this research has been created in collaboration with the people that you see on the screen. From where we place the sensors and how long they record for, whether we use supervised or unsupervised machine learning algorithms, the ecological questions we ask, and the designs that we create to make technologies that allow community members to explore and communicate the soundscapes of their forest are all collective decisions. Soundscapes like this one. Building strong relationships based on mutual trust has been key. Community members are able to shape the technology, highlighting the concerns with the way that this technology might impact their privacy, but also to suggest ways that the technology can embed and support their local knowledge. You see, community members know the forest like the back of their hands and already have approaches to conserving it. My job is to follow their lead. And I do this because I believe that we cannot build conservation technologies technologies that we want and need to protect the planet based on the same colonial ideas that conservation was founded in. We must take a different route, one where humans are not separated from nature and where justice is built in to the technologies that we use to protect it. In an era of emergency, many, often living far away from the front lines, worry that centering justice slows down effective conservation. But those on the front lines of the biodiversity and climate crises are not only victims, they are essential leaders for successful conservation. One study in 2021 from the UN found that indigenous conservation in Brazil, Bolivia and Colombia alone avoided 60 million metric tons of CO2 emissions. 
That's the same as taking 13 million cars off the road for a year. And this is just one of many studies that tells us what Indigenous and local communities have always known, that their knowledge, unique expertise and lived experience strengthen our solutions to the biodiversity and climate crises. Our world increasingly prioritises polarisation. You either believe that technology is going to save the world or that it's going to be the source of its demise. But I present to you a third option, one that lies in the messy middle, in the in-between. We can be excited by the power of technology to bring us closer to the natural world and to help us better understand how to protect it. And at the same time, be keenly aware that harming and hurting those that live closest to the environments that we're trying to protect is no way to achieve the green and abundant futures that we envision. I believe that we can build AI-powered technology that lives in harmony with people and the planet, but only if we centre justice. Thank you. <laughs>